tours. I do a little product development, I do a little sales. We're a really small kind of mom and pop operation here, or it's actually two brothers who run the place. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about Stumbletown itself before I take us off into the distillery here. Um, it was started by a guy named Craig. Uh, he is from Hanley, Saskatchewan. And Craig likes to say about 2016, he was coasting towards retirement. Uh, he was a power engineer. So he was collecting a really nice salary at like a chemical plant that made amines and amides outside the city. Uh, and yeah, he had a house, he had a kid. He was collecting a nice salary and looking forward to retirement. And then one day a bunch of suits came into his plant and the next day everybody was laid off, the plant was shut down. So Craig at this point was pretty pissed off. He didn't like that people he had never met to come in and flip his whole life plan upside down. So he kind of started the idea of either starting a, his own business or working for a business where he knew his bosses, he knew who the owners of the company were. Uh, at the same point in time, he noticed that a bunch of people that, or he'd been traveling around to kind of craft breweries and craft distilleries and noticed how much fun everybody seemed to be having in these kind of this, this workplace environment. So that's the other thing he was looking for is he wanted that kind of quality of life uh, increase. He wanted to really enjoy his job. Making amines wasn't that fun. He didn't really enjoy his job there. He was just cracking his paycheck. So he took a class in the, in the Okanagan in Kelowna. Uh, and realized that most of the like science and the production, sort of the manufacturing side of it was the same, same stuff, but different products. So we realized he didn't have to learn anything new really to make a distillery other than uh, what the product was itself. So the ball started rolling at that point. Um, and that's when his brother, Kalen got brought on board is once he got this building and had all the equipment, it was just him and a couple friends. And Kalen came home for Christmas about 2017 and realized what a, he saw what a mess this distillery was. He saw that his brother was in way over his head. Uh, so they kind of, the two of them and a couple of friends stacked all the columns you'll see at the back. They did all the plumbing, the piping themselves, and brought everything up to code. There's big fire codes. We worked with a very flammable product. Um, and that was when Craig kind of noticed the passion Kalen had for producing whiskey and gin. He took the job as a bartender to kind of learn more about the bartending side of it. Uh, he'd been reading tons of literature on it. And he just, before they even had the production license, kept just pounding Craig to, uh, when can we start making whiskey? When can we do it? When like, let's start, let's start, let's start. And so he kind of realized Kalen could potentially slide into that role of being kind of the head guy, that lead distiller here, and it could be a good mutual relationship. And in the end, that did work out. Um, Kalen, it's, it's especially a good deal because Kalen lives in BC. So we, we call him a hippie by trade. He does lots of like foraging and berry picking, and lots of hiking out there. Uh, but our stills aren't running full time necessarily right now. So he gets to come home and make as much product as we need for the next four months. Uh, and then he can go back to see PC or he's got a girlfriend, he's got a house there, et cetera. Kind of live that interior BC lifestyle. Uh, so that's the two of them. Uh, I introduced myself. Let's uh, take a trip into the distillery. Sorry if you guys get motion sick. I'm going to pick up my phone uh, and expand this picture so we can take a look. So there's the glass door. We're in the bar, by the way. So here's a bar, great event space for when we can have events again. Uh, I can socially distance fit about 16 people in here, but uh, let's go into the distillery. It's the real fun. So these are here. Um, I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. I hope everybody can see those. Uh, but it starts off over on this side when we're working with products. So um, I'm going to kind of take you through the basic process of how we take like a grain. Uh, convert it into an alcohol, and then then distill that. That's what you kind of want to keep in mind is we're working with grains here. Uh, we create this sort of simple sugar, turn that into alcohol, and then you concentrate that. That's how you make a spirit. Uh, so all that magic starts in this first tank here. Uh, we call it a mash tank. So in that big top hatch there, uh, it says Stumbletown on the top, you'll dump a whole bunch of milled grain in there. Um, and basically you're making a big batch of porridge, we call it. Uh, so you just add a little bit of heat, um, a malted grain that does it naturally will break down that starch into sugars. Uh, or in our case, we use purple wheat for our vodka. Um, we have to add an enzyme that's going to break that down into a sugar. Uh, but basically, yeah, just a little bit of heat, a little bit of water, make a big giant batch of porridge. Uh, for us, we're using that purple wheat. So it's a really cool grain from the developed at the University of Saskatchewan. So it's a local grain only grown here. Uh, we just kind of thought it was an interesting idea to try and create something with a product that's never been done before. That's kind of one of our mentalities here uh, is we really like to be creative with things, try things that nobody else has ever done before. So we put that purple wheat in there, we call it purple porridge. 
Uh, you leave it for about eight hours. It's going to break those starches down, those grains, into a simple sugar, which is what your yeast wants to eat. So after that, we're going to pump it into these three fermenters there. This will fill up each fermenter. So we're going to do it three times here. Um, for the ferment, this is where your beer and wine makers, for those that have been to Germany, they're going to love the wines there. They're actually great beer from Germany as well, so I shouldn't count that out. Uh, this is where, this is their bread and butter. This is where they are watching pH, they're watching their strains of yeast. Uh, they're really, really closely monitoring this fermentation process. Uh, for a distiller, we are less focused because some of that nuance is lost in the, the distillation process, that concentration. So we're trying to make what's called a distiller's beer often. Um, we just take a kind of basic beer uh, strain of yeast and bring it up to around 10% alcohol. Um, there's a cool thing, I don't, can't really see it right now. It's also really hard to show you guys with my camera. I'm sorry if I'm making anyone dizzy, but uh, there's these caps on top of here. And so yeast also releases CO2 when it makes uh, alcohol and you don't want that to build up. You'll have an explosion. Uh, so there's this really primitive technology that we use and it is literally this hose in a bucket. So you don't wanna just have it open to the air because then other bacteria, other microorganisms in the air can reinfect your fermentation and just ruin the whole batch. But you gotta release that pressure. And so if anybody's ever made home beer, home wine, you'll see a little bubble cap on top of that. It lets that air bubble out, but the water prevents anything from recontaminating back into the, the mash. So we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. We stuck a hose in a bucket of water. Um, the bucket of water also tells you if your fermentation is active because it'll be like pretty vigorously bubbling as it goes. Uh, it just lets you know that you're having a proper, proper ferment going on. Before we change to this system, there's a pretty funny story. Uh, Kalen uh, thought the ferment wasn't working because he wasn't getting any CO2 coming off. And so he went to go release that pressure and flip that cap off and the whole thing blew off and we sent mash all the way up to the ceiling. It's like a 24 foot ceiling up there. It covered the whole place in this purple porridge with a little bit of alcohol. And it was right before we started the tour. Um, by the way, I am okay with you guys interrupting me if you have any questions up to this point. I do talk quite fast and I'm covering a lot of material. Uh, so I will take a question period at the end, but feel free to un unmute yourselves if you have any questions as I'm going here. Um, this whole process of fermentation takes about three or four days. Uh, so you, you can usually tell once it's finished bubbling, but there's rule of thumb that it's gonna take us about three or four days to finish the ferment. Uh, then that's when the real fun for the distillation starts. So unless there's any questions, I'm going to walk around to our stills here. I'll give you a good view of them uh, from this angle before I get into nitty gritty. So we have actually basically three or four or three stills here. Um, we got our little copper still. Uh, then we have these three or two big tall column ones that are fed into by this one here. I don't know what you want to call that. Um, this is actually where a little bit of Germany comes in. So they're based off a of German design. Ideally, we would have bought from Germany, but with shipping costs and everything, we ended up buying from a Chinese company just because two brothers, we didn't have enough necessarily bankroll to spend the extra little bit for that German engineering. But he did buy uh, German inspired designs. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking vodka, but I started talking right where I'll talk, walk you through vodka. Um, it all starts in this tank here. Uh, so one of those fermenters will get pumped into here. Uh, then it's going to come up, or I'm going to get ahead of myself here. Um, how distillation works is it's based off the principle that alcohol evaporates at a lower temperature than water. So if you heat up your alcohol or heat the whole kind of mash, your alcohol is going to evaporate, and ideally your water is going to like recondense and fall back down. So if you just continuously heat it, alcohol is going to slowly concentrate as it goes through the stills and you'll collect it at the end. So we go it in here, we put it in here, we heat it up, it's gonna come up over the top there. Try to get my camera on there. There's a pipe that goes off to the left here, where's my finger? And it's gonna come back down into this first column here. Uh, so this one is four plates tall, uh, and it's often called a whiskey column or a stripping column. So it's the first run of when you're concentrating your ethanol here. Uh, it's going to get in the end around 60% alcohol. Um, and in each of these plates is kind of where that condensation and that re-evaporation happens. So there's a whole bunch of these things called bubble caps in there. I'm going to just reach for one real quick. 
or you can even visualize it better on this still. So there's a whole bunch of little holes in there where the alcohol comes up through, and then it has all these little bubble caps. So that gives a lot of surface area for that water and those like sulfates and contaminants and stuff to recondense and not continuously evaporate or end up in your final product. So just like this still, it's gonna evaporate, 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 and it'll come up over the top. Um, so for that one, it goes up for the top, goes around the other side, and into this guy here. I don't know if you guys can see it. Uh, this is called a condenser, it's this one here. So this is where we turn our alcohol vapor back into water. Not back into water, back into liquid. Uh, so it's gonna drip back down, come through this guy called a parrot's peak. And this is the first time you're gonna see the final product coming off the still. Uh, it's around 60% alcohol at this point. I don't know if we have enough light. There's actually a little glass vial in there uh, where the, the spirits will drip over top. And it's the first time you can taste it, you can smell it, sort of see the product that's coming off the still. Um, one of the reasons for that is you don't want to keep everything that you uh, distill. There's things like methanol, which is if you ever hear about bad moonshine, uh, that's the stuff that will make you go blind. There's stuff that tastes really solventy, like uh, that hand sanitizer that's been going around lately is made out of uh, kind of the other byproducts of distillation that you don't, they don't taste very good, so you don't want to keep them. So I'm kind of getting this idea of what we as distillers call cuts. And cuts are the byproduct or the stuff that you don't want to end up in the bottle because it tastes kind of solventy. And there's two kinds of cuts. Uh, there's three tanks that I have here. So the first kind of cut is called heads. We've got a moose head tank. Uh, then you have your hearts. This is the stuff you want to keep. This is the good stuff. And then the last one is called tails. Uh, that's what's going to come off the end. So the first things that come off your still, those are the methanols, isopropyl alcohols, the bad tasting stuff, solventy tasting stuff, uh, cheap vodka tasting stuff. Uh, that's what's called heads. So you'll collect a little bit in that heads tank. Um, there's a rule of thumb for how much you want to throw away to be safe. Um, and in general, it's kind of every distiller has a little bit of a different approach to it. So you can taste, taste it to see when it's tasting what more like a pure spirit or what's... Um, the word I'm looking for. Yeah, just that pure spirit. You want to get rid of that solventy taste. So then you'll start collecting some hearts after a while, and then eventually it'll start tasting kind of grassy and grainy towards the end. And that's where your tails. So that's your heavier compounds at the end. Um, we're just making vodka. There's more nuances when you make gin, et cetera. Um, but that's your basic distillation cuts. Um, so we're at hearts though. Hearts is not a final product necessarily. Uh, to, you could throw it in a whiskey barrel and age it for three years. You could then call that whiskey, but it's basically your first 60% alcohol sort of spirit. Um, when we're making vodka, vodka needs to be distilled to at least 95% alcohol. So that's when we pump it back into the first tank and run it through the center column. That's that eight or it's 16 plates tall. So the one that goes all the way up to the ceiling there. Uh, so it's the same idea, but with those extra plates is what, how you get to that 95%. So we redistill it up those 18 plates. Uh, I've actually seen it come off the still at about 99.9, .9, it read out at 100% alcohol. So that's after only two distillations and you get to nearly 100% alcohol. Um, a lot of those, a lot of companies market vodka as like 14 times distilled. Uh, like they'll, they'll say they distill it a whole bunch of times, but Based, based off our experience, um, there's not much point of redistilling it once you get to that 90 or 99% alcohol. You're just wasting time and money and energy. Um, so we have found that the cuts actually, so back to those three tanks, uh, that actually makes a bigger difference in the final product's taste um, is how much you cut from it. So there's that perfect sort of range in the middle or you get a really pure neutral spirit that you can make a really good tasting premium vodka. And then cheaper vodkas, the ones that taste a little bit solventy are usually throwing away less so they can charge less for their product. Um, but we choose to have a premium product, so we cut a little bit more. 95% um, vodka or 99% vodka, or so alcohol at this point, is not very palatable. Uh, when you taste it, it evaporates immediately in your tongue. So the last step to make a spirit is you do what's called proofing. Uh, so when you Proofing is basically watering down is one way to say it. I don't have to say that because it sounds weird, but uh, you're, you're lowering that concentration. Um, we use a really pure water system in the back. It's reverse osmosis water. So it's got like two per million parts of contaminants in there or salts or whatever. Um, and you proof it down to usually 40% for a vodka. 
Um, the last thing for vodka is it has to be carbon filtered, uh, which removes again those last impurities to make a really pure spirit. So that's vodka. Uh, we do a few other things. We got whiskey barrels. I think it might be too dark to see, but we do have whiskey on the way. We're only two and a half years old here, so it's not gonna be ready till Christmas. But if you do like whiskey, we have lots of whiskey. Um, I'm gonna talk about our pot still now though. So that is this little guy right here. This is where we make most of our gins and our liqueurs. Uh, it's just a little bit smaller so we can run some smaller batches. And you, we also, a pot still is usually used to keep a little bit more flavor. So vodka, you wanted all the impurities out. When we're making things like limoncello or amaro, our gins, uh, you would want to keep that flavor. So these little bubble caps we have in here, those have all been removed because we want all of those essential oils to not recondense on those uh, bubble caps and to end up in the final product. So to make limoncello, um, since we're kind of a, a German club meeting here again, I'm gonna, it's also can be comparable to like schnapps. Uh, we don't make any schnapps here yet, but it's kind of a similar idea or similar process. So you take our lemon peel or you take our neutral grain spirit we produce and you soak it in lemon peel for limoncello um, if you wanted to make like a, a cherry schnapps, you could either distill the cherry or soak that neutral grain spirit in the cherries to make some kind of homemade batches. Uh, but you can add a little bit of flavor. Alcohol is a really good solvent, so to pull all those flavors out of there. Um, there's also, I guess I'll talk a little bit about gin. There's a, gin is really fun for us because we like that creativity. So um, with gin, the only rule is that it has to have juniper in it. And other than that, there's a whole world of flavors we can add. So there's a um, base, or there's a bunch of ways that you can get it out of there. So there's a thing called a gin basket up here as well. So you can put all your botanicals up in that gin basket, uh, and then it's going to basically vapor distill. So as the alcohol comes up through there, it's going to extract those essential oils and bring those into your final product. So you could do a similar thing if you're making a schnapps, if you're making a liqueur, um, and then when you proof it, you can proof with. Uh, like a hibiscus tea or a cherry juice. There's a bunch of different products you can produce from that. And that is basically distillation 101 at Stumbletown here. Um, I do, I am gonna make you guys a cocktail, um, but at this point, is there any questions about the distillation process? It was a bit weird doing it virtually. So uh, thanks for bearing with me guys. So Curtis, just a quick question. You guys usually do these in person then? Yeah, this, that's, that's actually the first tour I've done uh over a phone here usually we do them in person and it's much easier to point for, to the uh different equipment and stuff here can can people come in right now and do the tours uh yeah usually i like to book them ahead of time uh just because i'm basically the only bartender here so it does take me away from the bar uh but you can send us an email at info at stumbletown.ca and book a tour um we have done groups of more than four. We kind of social distance them, but right now it's kind of groups of four we're limited to. Uh, but right now, Friday, Saturdays, we are open for tours, even for coming and have a drink. We have everything set up for the SHA safety rules here. Okay, I have one last question. Are there mm -hmm. any plans for you guys to make schnapps? Um, I have made schnapps like, like I made a rhubarb liqueur. Okay. Uh, I don't think you can call it schnapps because it had too much sugar in it probably, mm -hmm. but it was to around 30%. So we, we do things like schnapps, but we just haven't called them schnapps per se. Okay. Oh, good. Definitely. And we're open to all kinds of ideas here. We like trying small batch things and making a bunch of fun things. So. Good. I'd just like to remind you that there's a, a good German population here in the province that would probably very much appreciate um, you making stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. That's actually, uh, I do a family from Germany and that was one of my most fond memories about 10 years ago when I was there. They're in kind of, I think, Oberkirch. For, for, forgive me for my terrible German. Um, like sort of the southern black forest area and so sitting around with my cousins and drinking cherry schnapps when I was like 17 18 years old and drank a little too much of it so actually the cocktail that uh I'm gonna make is uh has that sour cherry influence that cherry influence from my time in Germany oh, wow. um, question about the old mash um often it gets turned into cattle or pig feed especially with breweries so I don't know what we do with ours actually. Um, I think we don't turn it 
into that because we do some weirder mashes, but lots of breweries and uh, stuff turn it into um, cattle feed or pig feed. Good. Um, I think Carolyn wants to know where you guys are located. Do I have that question right, Carol? Um, we are on Quebec Avenue by um, High Key Brewery and where Prairie Sun Brewery used to be. Um, so Quebec before Circle. Um, there's that big like uh, scrap metal junkyard kind of across the street from us where they have that big T-Rex and that giant kind of Atlas sort of man made out front. The sculptures are right across the street from them. Good. And I think Janice wants help. We have to send her help to Toronto to make to make some uh, distilled items. We do <laughs> ship to uh, Ontario now. So if you check our website out, we do ship over to Ontario. Good. Uh, I'm going to step in the bar here. I just have my phone set up where you guys can see me making this cocktail really quick. So I won't be able to see, touch my phone, but you should be able to hear me and I should be able to hear you. So I'll be right back. Good. This was a few weeks ago when I picked up my items. It was the first time that I was in the distillery and it's um, a cute little spot for sure. I didn't, I was sad that I didn't realize that you guys were there before, but um, definitely know now. And I would like to point out that uh, I have my eye on your vodka, Curtis, because I have a recipe for uh, a German eggnog that I'd like to make. Um, so you might see me coming in in the next few weeks again to pick up a bottle. Wonderful. And like our vodka is really high quality. Um, it does have some flavor notes. It's not really what vodka is supposed to be, but if we did win uh, second place, we tied for second in a competition in San Francisco out of like 300 vodkas from around the world. So we're pretty happy with how that product turned out. But it's a good, it's a great base for any like homemade liqueurs, any homemade eggnogs. Um, I definitely dabbled with that last, I've been a bartender for 10 years, so lots of homemade. And I have a huge garden at home, so I get a lot of inspiration from what I can grow with myself. And I think your products are also available at, what is it called? It was just some of mine, Pile of Bones um, on Dudney in Regina. Yeah, uh, we're in most liquor stores in Regina as well. Sobeys oh. and co ops are big supporters of ours. The SLPAs carry not all of our products. Um, some of our products don't aren't sold anywhere but the distillery, but kind of our mainstays, a couple types of gin, uh, our vodka, and our lemoncello is starting to be probably around up here. Um, how much does a 750 retail for? A set of, sorry? 750 milliliter, like, I don't know what that, like, I don't know what that's called. A regular um, bottle. <laughs> is that how big like, your bottles are? At about 39 to 42 range. Cool. All right, well, I'm gonna make a cocktail really quick, limoncello here. Um, but you could apply kind of this sort of ratio or cocktail style to any uh, liqueur that you want, any flavor you want. Um, as a bartender, I kind of talk about um, sort of like certain ratios that you're trying to balance. So a huge one that you wanna watch is your sugar, so your sort of acidity or your sour, um, which is usually your lemon juice or lime juice. Um, and then you're also gonna watch your basically your alcohol percentage, so the ratio of your alcohol spirits to water or soda water, um, and all the juices and sweeteners have water in them as well. Uh, so people will often think of cocktailing as kind of this bunch of people in lab coats or kind of snobby, pretentious bartenders in suits and ties. I really don't like that personally. I think you can make amazing cocktails at home, and I, I really encourage people to not be intimidated uh, by experimenting. Um, most main bars around the world, they follow kind of three or four, maybe five uh, classic cocktails that are tried and true, and they just do little tweaks and twists on those. So instead of just sugar, they will use like a cherry syrup, or instead, like, instead of a whiskey, they'll switch to sort of a specialty product. You just kind of sub and switch. Um, for today, I'm going to make basically a lemoncello spritz or lemoncello soda. Uh, so it's based off just lemoncello and sparkling white wine. Um, I don't have sparkling white wine. We only use Saskatchewan products. So I'm going to use kind of a soda water cooler style instead. Um, but I'm going to start off in this 12 ounce cup I have here. I'm going to fill it up with ice. So it's going to be a six ounce cup. And for those that don't love numbers, uh, just 
try and follow along here. I'm not going to make you do math. I won't be best at the end. But uh, just remember, it's a six parts total in that. So fill it up with ice. We're going to fit six ounces in this cup. Um, most drinks can be built in a cup. Uh, if you shake them, you are diluting and adding aeration. For this drink, we can just build it into our cup. I uh, have our limoncello here. So I'm going to start do one and a half ounce more of that. Um, limoncello is a liqueur. So I just added alcohol, sugar, and water to my cocktail. Something to keep in mind, as well as lemon peel flavor. Uh, I mentioned sour or cherries before from my days in the or Black Forest and at our bar, we in Saskatchewan, we grow tons of sour cherries. So this is a sour cherry syrup with grenadine that I made. Uh, basically, it was cherries with sugar reduced on a hot stove with a splash of water to make it better. So you can make it at home yourself with basically any fruit. You take sugar and water, add some fruit into it, reduce it, simmer it for about 30 minutes. It'll make a really good flavored syrup. And they're always better when you make it at home yourself. And I'm going to do half a shot of that. So I have two ounces total in there now. Um, it will be on the sweet side with those two ounces of sugary ingredients. Uh, so I do need some acidity to balance that out. So I have fresh squeezed lemon juice here. And if it's fresh squeezed, it's always best. Uh, the kind of real lemon ones that you buy at the store aren't quite as good. You're always better off buying lemon juice. So I can do uh, three quarters of a shot in there. And then this is just a spritzer, so I'm going to fill it up with soda. And uh, since it was a six ounce glass, or six ounces with ice, uh, that would have been about three or four and a quarter shots of soda water, or three and a quarter. Right? See, I told you we were going to do math. So I won't with that. And yeah, that's basically a spritzer. So delicious cocktail. Um, Finishing touches are always nice. Um, I do like to remind people as well that uh, the worst drink in the world uh, is always improved by the people you're with. So in my opinion, that is more important than creating a perfect drink is the people that you're with, people that surround you in that environment uh, will make the worst tasting thing the best. So we've all drank bad wine at a family gathering and had a really jolly time. So that's more important. Cheers, guys. Thanks for uh, coming to my talk. Good. Okay. Uh, the only thing that I wish we could be doing right now is joining you, Curtis. Uh, I, 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 really drink. I, I just have, a, I have a little bit of a story about your, your um, purple wheat vodka. A friend of mine from Guelph, Ontario, sent me a CBC article about the purple wheat and the fact that you used it for your purple vodka. So I went out to the liquor store and got two bottles, one for me. And the next time I went to Ontario, I took her one. So it travels <laughs> because it's, it's, a, it's a Saskatchewan product. I was so impressed that you were using purple Saskatchewan wheat, which is developed here. And the other part of my story is um, when I had my bottle at home, um, I had my son over for dinner and he works for the University of Saskatchewan um, um, field crop facility. And so I said, oh, I've got something special that's um, Saskatchewan made. And I pulled out your Stumbletown um, purple vodka. And he says, oh, I know all about that because my boss developed the purple wheat. <laughs> that's cool. And uh, I'm around the bar and get my phone. Just give me one second here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Does anybody know, Janice wants to know if the purple wheat vodka is purple in color or clear? When it's I, clear. Yeah, when I've seen clear. it. In, yeah, in after purple. it's distilled, it's it's clear. Okay. But it has a purple label. <laughs> so <laughs> is that act is is the wheat itself purple or is that yes. part yes. of the, okay. the the well actually the outside of the wheat is purple. Oh, oh no, I think when you crush it, it's purple also. Yes, it is it's a purple wheat. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Charles brought me a sample, but I haven't been able to grind it yet. <laughs> I don't have a mill. <laughs> Good. It's pretty cool. And it's the, the, the chemical that's in it is what's in like blueberries and beets that give them that really dark purple hue. Um, and has a cool flavor with it that was, we were just inspired to make our product out of it. And that's something we really push uh, as a distiller and kind of to expand beyond Saskatchewan. 
is we produce some of the best crops. We have some of the best farmers in the world in Saskatchewan, especially when it comes to grains. And so we can make really pure, awesome, high quality grain spirits right in Saskatchewan. And it's almost a shame that it's taken us this long to start to get some local small craft distilleries to start competing, I guess, or um, like just being offered compared to kind of the mainstays that are all over the world that we should be able to produce better products with our better qualities grains here. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say on my next trip to Germany, whenever that might be, I'll definitely be grabbing some bottles from you and uh, giving them as presents to my family in Germany. Um, we have one more question. Um, how has support for local been for you during COVID, I think? Um, really good uh, for the, like, the most part. We've had a bit of a lull since Christmas, but uh, Christmas time was absolutely crazy. We were, we had four of us full time packing up boxes and sending gift bags out the door. Um, and we've also made a huge effort ourselves. So um, lots of our kind of like drink kits, we make Caesar kits with a bunch of local producers as well. Um, and we were doing local markets here for a little while before they became not able to do because of social distancing but uh it's it's been awesome and like um i guess the, the best example i might have isn't from like a, a customer supporting us necessarily um but more of the like attitude of all the local businesses here and distilleries so lucky bastards is another big distillery in town and black box distillery and people always kind of look at me funny because i'll wear lucky bastard shirts to work um or they're just kind of think that us as competitors should be fighting for market share, et cetera. Um, and we all help each other out. So Craig sat on conference calls with uh, Carrie Bowman, and I can't remember his name, even though I know it, uh, at Black Box, and they helped him set up his distillery. And so small craft distilleries have maybe like one or 2% of the market share in Saskatchewan and Canada. And we see it as if we can work together and get everybody to buy local that that's gonna, if, if everyone bought local, there would need to be about a hundred more of us doing it here. So we wanna build the market up rather than fight together, like, I don't know, fight with each other for the few people that are doing it. So it's uh, it's been awesome. And like all local bars, local producers and all kinds of the beer and cider producers around town, uh, we have a pretty cool little network that all supports each other, so. That's awesome to hear really. Yeah, it's, it's really nice. And I know that like, it's not like that everywhere. Like I've, I've heard of craft breweries and stuff fighting in other cities. Sorry, I'm trying to get back to that message. I saw there was one question. There yeah, is. Um, from Valerie, we have what types of gin do you produce? Uh, so we actually have six types of gin that we have made. Um, the original gin is not a like beef eater style gin. It's not really juniper forward. Uh, it's more like, has lots of these like bitter sort of rooty earthy botanical flavors to it um things like uh birch bark spruce sap rose hips that grow well in saskatchewan um sea buckthorn berries is where our sour component comes from uh i don't know i, I kind of have to taste it try it i want to describe all these gins have you not be able to taste it but that's our original gin it's called a new west dry style it's it's for the gin lovers it's really bitter and botanical and bold um, we make a caesar gin so we took all the components of a caesar like bacon worcester uh, chili, garlic, we threw all that into our pot still and distilled basically a gin made for Caesar. So you don't need to add any spices. You can just mix it with tomato juice uh, or tomato juice and clam broth is what tomato is. I don't know if everybody, where everybody's from, but uh, um, we also have our most popular product now is our pink IPA gin. Uh, so it's inspired by a beer next door at the brewery. Uh, it's slightly hopped in the gin, but it's not like an IPA, uh, but it has this beautiful pink color to it. Um, if the bottles were closer, I don't want to leave this, this camera shot, but I'd show you. It has this beautiful pink hue from a hibiscus flower. So we proof it with hibiscus tea. So it has this beautiful pink color. It's a really kind of tropical sort of, I don't want to use the word fruity because it is gin, but it has like notes of strawberry and rhubarb. It's extremely versatile. It tastes good and everything. Um, then we've also done a Navy Strength gin. We've done one with like pear and Christmas spices, kind of like a poached baked pear. Uh, we call it cardamom and pear. It's very floral, very spicy. Um, and what is the sixth one? Oh, is it uh, the tea one? Tea. Uh, so it's a kind of a garden, simple gin recipe with snap peas, uh, cantaloupe, citrus, and juniper. 
um, it's made to be kind of a tall drink on a hot day. Nice. Uh, there's one more question I have from Timothy. Do you have a local delivery service? Um, usually one of us will just run it out to you. So if you gave us a call at the story and you're in Saskatoon, um, one of us would probably be willing to drop a bottle off at your doorstep. So yes, um, you can pay for shipping, but it's like 20 bucks in town. So if you just gave me a call, I'd be happy to run a bottle to your house. Um, if you bought it through the online store, that's a good pick up. Good. Are there any other questions for Curtis? I feel like I need to head to your store right away and buy bottles of stuff to try out cocktails and in, in my baking. It um, is it's a lot of fun. It's nice to, well, you try out your, um, while well, you get to be inventive with your drinks and I tend to go on the baking cooking side, so. I'm a terrible baker. I'm not good at following instructions for <laughs> recipes. I, I like to cook with, uh, I love cooking, but I, I'm more of like a little bit of this, a little bit of that kind of person. And so my baking usually doesn't rise properly and stuff like that, so. <laughs> good. Well, um, for one of my videos, the Google Loop that I made with your guys' limoncello, I had to make the recipe and this is embarrassing to say because I'm a seasoned baker and cook, but I had to make it about three or four times before it finally worked um, for me. And I blame it on the fact that I don't have the same flour as they do in Germany. The flour here is very different from uh, the type of flour that you can get in Germany. So in Germany, I want, I, I'm not over exaggerating, but I want to say there's like for sure over 20 different types of flour ranging from like pastry flour, all-purpose flour, you've got spelt flour, buckwheat flour, and they're re readily available. But whenever you pick a German recipe and make it here in North America, it always there always tends to be a problem with the flour because it's just not the same consistency. So that's, that's one of the problems that I run into. So. That was my little embarrassing story of baking. Um, I don't think it's embarrassing. That's, just <laughs> it's a shame that we don't have, since we grow so many grains here, but it's just like all grains all get shipped somewhere and then they get shipped back as flour. So yeah. I don't think there's too many local flour producers or mills anymore in Saskatchewan. It's just a no. shame. Yeah, that's true. For um, the amount of wheat we have here, it would be nice. Exactly. So anyway, yeah, if you want to check out that recipe that took me forever to make, um, feel free to check out the the YouTube channel, and it en it ended up being very tasty. It just took me a while to get the recipe right. So good. I was able to feed my husband um, quite a bit through all these cakes and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, okay. Um, any last minute questions while we have Curtis here with us? Oh, um, I have I have one more question. Um, where did the name Stumbletown come from? That's a good one I always forget to answer. Oh. Um, so the town part came from Craig wanted to be kind of a destination spot somewhere like off the beaten trail where people could come and like enjoy our space, but like be like a more of a destination, somewhere that you come travel to and come hang out at. And uh, the stumble part um, was kind of a, a crack at like, alluding to that we're a place that is a fun place to come to maybe get a little tipsy get a little stumbly um but of course we do promote responsible drinking so we can't like fully uh promote that but it was kind of just a nod um he always like uh, he always likes to say the joke um drink responsibly town didn't have the same ring to it um so we like to say that we're, we're a fun place and wanted to create that sort of atmosphere that lifestyle that you're coming to our table to have a great time maybe get a little stumbly um, but we always make sure people have safe rides home, et cetera. So that's kind of where the name Stumbletown came from.